that's just for me. That's just because I need to, that's how I'm about to start talking. <clears throat> All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's uh, about that time, so I want to go ahead and get started with Sunday school this morning. Um, today we'll be looking at um, Proverbs thirteen twenty four. Proverbs thirteen twenty four says, "Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him." Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for my brothers and sisters that are here and also those who aren't here. Um, be with us this morning. Uh, be with me as I deliver your word. Um, help me be clear and, uh, and teach only what you have me teach, Lord. Be with me this morning and it's in Christ's name we pray. Okay, so first of all, two things. I'm going to uh, preface this by saying, one, I uh, fully admit that I do not do what I'm going to teach on this morning well. I have a lot of work to do in this area, as I found out this week studying for this. Second, this is going to be Scarlett's least favorite message that I have prepared. Because if I listen to myself this morning, um, there's going to be a lot more discipline happening in our household. So, that being said, I'm going to read to you all the 12 rules for raising delinquent children. This was written, this is an actual, it's an actual um, leaflet that was written by uh, the Houston Police Department. And it was printed and in the local chamber of commerce uh, in the business section. One, begin with infancy to give the child everything he wants. In this way, he will grow up to believe the world owes him a living. When he, pick up, when he picks up bad words, laugh at him. This will make him think he's cute. I also encourage him to pick up other cuter phrases that will blow the top off of your head later. Never give them any spiritual training. Wait till they're 21, then let them decide for himself. Avoid the use of the word wrong. It may develop a guilt complex. This will condition him to believe later when he's arrested for stealing a car, that society is against him and he's being persecuted. Number five, pick up everything he leaves lying around, books, shoes, clothes. Do everything for him so that he will be experienced in throwing all responsibility on others. Number six, let him read any printed matter he can get his hands on. Be careful that the silverware and the drinking glasses are clean and sterilized, but don't worry about his mind feasting on garbage. Seven, quarrel frequently in the presence of your children. In this way, they will not be too shocked when the home is broken up later. Number eight, give the child all the spending money he wants. Never let him earn his way. Why, shouldn't, or why should he have things as tough as you did? Number nine, satisfy his every craving for food, drink, and comfort. See that every sensual desire is gratified. Denial may lead to harmful frustration. Number 10, take his part against neighbors, teachers, policemen. They are all prejudiced against your child. Then 11, when he gets into real trouble, apologize to yourself by saying, I could never do, or I never could do anything with him. 12, prepare yourself for a life of grief, because you'll surely have it. 
So once again, looking at Proverbs 13, 24, it tells us, Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Notice that it doesn't say whoever likes their son a little bit less. It says whoever hates their child does not discipline them. Hate is a, is a pretty strong word here. That being said, the first thing I want to look at this morning is the rod. Let's think about the bi biblical significance of the rod. In the Bible, we see a lot about God using the rod. 2 Samuel 7, verses 13 through 17 says, He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever in accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision. Nathan spoke to David. And then in Psalm 89, verses 31 through 33, it says, If they violate my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their, transgr their transgressions with the rod and their iniquity, their iniquity with many stripes. I will not remove him, or I will not remove from him my steadfast love, or be false to my faithfulness. Isaiah ten five through six says, "Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, the staff in their hands is my fury. Against a godless nation I send them, and against the people of my wrath I command them, or I command him, to take spoil and seize plunder." And to tread them down like the mirror of the streets, mire of the streets. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 says, I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. And then we also see it in the New Testament. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 4, 19 through 21, it says, But I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. And I will find out, not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with, a lo with love and a spirit of, of gentleness? So, I read those just to show us that throughout the Bible, we see the rod used as a symbol of a disciplinary tr uh, tool in the hand of our Lord. No worries. 2 Samuel 7, verses 13 through 17. Yes, sir. If anybody has anything, just don't hesitate to stop me. Um, where was I? Should use that pen, Pastor David. Um, it is used for uh, painful correction of rebellious behavior of his people. The other thing we learn is that responding with the rod to those that disobey is not contrary to the character of God. It is not, therefore, contrary to godliness. To be a father, even God, the most loving being there has ever been, the Bible tells us that he is love. And to be a father means to be willing to discipline and correct bad behavior and set things right. Now, the second thing I want us to look at this morning is that, full, uh, is that it is foolishness that makes punishment necessary. Or said in another way, punishment is necessary because of the foolishness, foolishness that is within us. Proverbs tells us several times, uh, starting uh, with Proverbs 10, 13 through 14, on the lips of him who has understanding, wisdom is found, but a rod is for the back of him who lacks sense. The wise lay up knowledge, but the mouth of a fool brings ruin near. Proverbs 14, 2 and 3 says, Whoever walks in uprightness fears the Lord, but he who is devious 
in his ways despises him. By the mouth of a fool comes a rod for his back, but the lips of the wise will preserve them. Proverbs 18, 5 through 6 says, It is not good to be partial to the wicked or to deprive the righteous of justice. A fool's lips walk into a fight, and his mouth invites a beating. Proverbs 21.11 When a scoffer is punished, the simple becomes wise. When a wise man is instructed, he gains knowledge. Then Proverbs 26.3 says a whip for the horse, bridle for the donkey, and a rod for the back of fools. So how do you manage a horse with a whip? How do you manage a donkey with a bridle? How do you manage a fool with a rod to the backside? And uh, our children are fools, by the way. Proverbs 20:30 says, "Blows that wound cleanse away evil. Strokes made, our strokes make clean the innermost parts." When a person is foolish, they need this kind of punishment to have inward change. As I've heard Pastor Ricky put it before, uh, people need to be calibrated. Our society doesn't like to hear that, though. We live in a live and let live society. Everyone's entitled to be whoever they want to be. Everyone can make their own decisions, and if they're wrong, they'll figure it out or they won't, it really doesn't matter. But the Bible tells us that we are indeed fools that need the correction of the rod to make that foolishness leave us. So in the first two points this morning, we see that one, uh, the significance of the rod, God uses the rod, and he, uh, and he is love. Then we also see the necessity of the rod because we are foolish, and when God chastens us, it's because of his love for us. Uh, let's look at Hebrews now. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet re uh, resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. We're going to come back and look at that again in a little bit. But when God disciplines us, it means that we're, we're not illegitimate children. We're his children. It's how he shows us love. Um, the King James says that we're not, uh, we're not bastards. We can think, we can think, excuse me, in the hard times that God's angry with us. But it, what it really shows us when he's disciplining us is that is that he actually loves us and that we are his and we're not cast off. He cares for us, therefore he chastens us to bring us back to himself. He does this to make us better and more godly followers of him. It's awesome that the Bible doesn't tell us that in the bad times that it's not that bad or it doesn't really hurt. In fact, it tells us that all chastening is grievous and causes sorrow in those moments. But in that sorrow, we must know that this pruning is to produce the fruit that we are, that we are called to bear. Excuse me. 
This being said about how our Heavenly Father disciplines us shows us that discipline in and of itself is an act of love. A father that hates his son spares the rod. And just like our Bibles can't just sit on the coffee table collecting dust, neither can the rod or the paddle or the belt or, as my mom used to use on me when I was a kid, a wooden spoon. Uh, whatever you use, uh, whatever you use. But the point is that it must be used if we love our children like we say we do. If we allow the dust to gather on that rod, it shows that we don't love our children, but that we, in fact, hate them, according to our scripture today. Being lenient is not a sign of love or tenderness, but leniency plants a seed that will later reap a harvest of disaster. If we don't discipline our children, then we are wrong. Uh, uh, when they are wrong, we do them a tremendous disservice. Uh, we got an example of Eli and David in the Old Testament and how they raised their sons. Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 2, we see a huge mistake that Eli makes in his life, that he did not discipline his sons. And then in a few chapters later, we see the culmination of that lack of discipline in chapter 4 as the Philistines capture the ark. In 1 Samuel 2, verses 12 through 22, it says, a man of Benjamin ran from the battle line and came to Shiloh that, uh, the same day. With his clothes torn and with dirt on his head, when he arrived, Eli was sitting on his seat by the road watching, for his heart, uh, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when, he came, uh, and when the man came into the city and told the news, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the sound of the outcry, he said, What's this uproar? The man hurried and came and told Eli. Now Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were set so that he could not see. And the man said to Eli, I am he who has come from the battle. I fled from the battle today. And he said, How did it go, my son? He who brought the news answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has also been a great defeat among the people. Your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead and the ark of God has been captured. As soon as he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell over backwards from his seat by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died, for the man was old and heavy. He had judged Israel for 40 years. Now his daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and about to give birth, and when she heard the news of the ark of God was captured, or the news that the ark of God was captured, and that her father-in-law and her husband were both dead, she bowed and gave birth, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the woman attending her said to her, Do not be afraid, for you have born a son. But she did not answer or pay attention. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory of God has departed from Israel, because the ark of God has been captured, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory of God has departed, has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. Then we can look at the example of King David, the man after God's own heart. We see the incest of uh, Amnon with his sister. Then we see Absalom's murder and rebelliousness. And then Adonijah's schemes against his own father and his ambition to become king. Scripture tells us that David brought that upon himself because of his lack of discipline. In 1 Kings, Scripture tells us that he had never at any time displeased him, speaking of Ad Adonijah. And that's one of the paradoxes we see in this, in the Bible, describing how we are to discipline our kids, is that being displeasing to our children is in fact how we show that we love them. If I were to give today's lesson a little title, it'd be The Paradox of Perfect Punishment. The best thing we can give our kids is godly punishment. And we see that when Eli and David failed to do so, it brought disaster to their family. Next, uh, how are we to see our children in order to properly raise them 
in a way that pleases God. So first of all, we don't need to see the, uh, we need to see them how God sees them and not how the world sees them. We're not chance particles of stardust colliding with itself to where it doesn't matter. We're not a product of evolution. If we were, then we could just train them like a pet. Use behavioral modification techniques that like a dog trainer might use because they would have nothing or they would be nothing more to us than intelligent dogs or pets of some sort. <clears throat> but they are in fact made in the very image of God. But then we also have to see that these beautiful, cuddly, cute little image bearers that we bring home from the hospital are also not innocent. Our, ch our children are not innocent beings that get corrupted by the world. In Genesis, in Genesis 8, we're told that for, uh, for the intention of a man's heart is evil from his youth. So from the beginning, from the earliest days, our hearts are full of evil. Now, I wasn't always this way, but after becoming a father, I see just how precious the little babies are. Uh, I love them. I love everything about them. It just seems so beautiful, right? Um, even when they cry. Uh, it's beautiful being around the new life of that image bearer of God. But we must not forget, no matter how much we adore them, that they are fallen people and they are wicked from their youth, just like we were. They, uh, they don't need to learn it. It's not something that's taught. And I'm sure any parent in here can attest to that. Uh, Psalm 53, 8 says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray from birth, speaking lies. One of the uh, first things I can think of, or one of the earliest things I can think of, when, uh, in my own experience as a father, when Scarlett, like, accidentally dropped her toy. And so I picked it up and gave it back to her, right? And then the next time... She started throwing it on purpose. And before I realized it, or before I knew it, uh, she was playing fetch with dad, and I was the dog. Um, later on, she would, uh, you know, knock over her food. Uh, sure, sometimes it was an accident, but other times it was spiteful and on purpose and defiant. So, as I was looking at this, I thought of something I. Uh, I heard R.C. Sproul say years ago, uh, I think he was the first person I heard say it, I think I've heard it said other times, but he said, uh, we are not sinners because we sin, but we sin because we are sinners. And that's the case for our children as well. <laughs> so we must see our precious children both as beautiful image bearers of God and being so valuable for that reason we as parents must also correct the wickedness, wickedness that is in them. So the true value will not come to, uh, cannot, excuse me, will not come to fruition uh, if that evilness in them is not dealt with properly. Corrective discipline is absolutely necessary. Uh, Proverbs 22.15 says, Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline drives it far from him. So, do you believe what the Bible tells us about our kids? Do, believe, do we believe that they are foolish from the womb? If we do, then our hope is found in Proverbs that this rod that we use will drive that foolishness away. So, what happens if we hate our kids and we neglect the rod? Once again, we're going to turn in Proverbs to Proverbs 29.15. Proverbs 29.15 says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. So if we don't step in and correct our children, they will bring our families shame. This is what the Word of God tells us. They will dishonor us and our family name if we neglect the, our duty as, as parents. Once again, Proverbs 23, 
verses 12 through 14 says, Apply your heart to instruction and your ear to words of knowledge. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. If you strike him with a rod, you will save his soul from Sheol. So we can see, uh, we can see here that the same or the shame that the undisciplined child brings to the family is not the only thing that the rod prevents, but it will actually save our children from hell. This is literally a matter of life and death. Many in our world are against corporal punishment and say that punishing the child in doing so, uh, we're doing bodily damage and moving them in the direction of death. But the Word of God tells us just the opposite. Proverbs tells us, he will not die if you punish your child, but, in fact, by doing so, you will keep him from dying. It's not in spite of the punishment that they won't die, but it is because of the punishment that they won't die. We must punish with the rod to save our children from hell. We can be, I know some people can be hyper-Calvinist in this area, and think that, well, God's going to save who he saves. I doesn't matter what I do with my child. But in fact, he uses us to teach our children. And if they are elect, they see the scriptures when we read them to them and teach them those. So, oh, where was I? Sorry. So our children are destined for, for destruction unless we stand up and point them to the word and take up the rod that, uh, and take up the rod, I'm sorry. Uh, the Bible tells us again in Proverbs, Proverbs talks a lot about this, obviously. Proverbs 19, 18, discipline your son, for there is hope. Do not set your heart on putting him to death. So if we don't discipline our children, we're basically conspiring for their spiritual destruction. So before I move on, I'm, I'm, Getting close to uh, my closing. I only got a few pages left. But at that point, has anybody got any thoughts? They haven't gotten to the point where they're they're sinful yet, or they've been corrupted yet. I appreciate that. Uh, I was thinking as I was preparing this that there's uh, probably a lot of guys out here that are uh, more uh, have a lot more experience, uh, considering I have one six-year-old daughter, and I know a lot of y'all guys have a lot more experience with raising children than you, but or than me. But uh, I think that maybe uh, precisely why Pastor Laramie. Uh, gave me this passage to teach on because um, I needed to learn it a lot. And uh, any of y'all other guys out there that have raised a family, feel free to chime in anytime. Go for it.
Like uh, Mike said to Rob last week, uh, I, I did not give him my notes because uh, uh, we're going to get there here in just a second too. So, <clears throat> Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Right. Absolutely. I will say I'm not looking forward to the teenage years. <laughs> I will I will admit that. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <clears throat>
Now, the thing I was thinking about grandparents is, you know, like the, you know, they may see something uh, that, you know, us parents don't see because y'all, you know, you see a thing or two because you've seen a thing or two, <laughs> or you know a thing or two because you've seen a thing or two, you know. Uh, you've got more experience, more wisdom, and you may see something that we're, as parents, blind to, you know, that you may see faster. But thank you, Pastor. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Amen. No worries. We got time. Absolutely, and uh, I, I, you know, it's one of those, I, I could tell somebody that same thing and, you know, followed up with that, ask me how I know, you know, I, I've, yeah, I've tried that out. 
still dealing with consequences of uh, things I've done. Um, <clears throat> so, moving forward, not only is correction needed to save them from hell, but it is also needed to depart, to depart into our children wisdom. Proverbs 29.15 says, The rod and reproof give wisdom. But a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. We don't just correct our kids to keep them from destruction and damnation, but we also uh, must do it so they can learn wisdom. It's not just punishment, but it is molding their character, but it's also molding their character in a godly fashion. Uh, Ephesians 6, 4, which I think is what Brandon was referencing earlier, it says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So it's not just the discipline, it's also the instruction that comes with it. When we discipline, it must be the Lord's molding and instruction that they're hearing and not just ours. We don't provoke our kids. In a book on this subject called Withhold Not Correction. That's the name of the book, Withhold Not Correction. It says, fathers are not to create in their children feelings of anger or frustration caused by undue severity, by injustice, in the application of discipline, or by an inconsistent or unreasonable exercise of authority. I'll read that one more time. Fathers are not to create in their children feelings of anger or frustration caused by undue severity, by injustice in the application of discipline, or by an inconsistent or unreasonable exercise of authority. Discipline cannot be an opportunity for us to vent our own personal frustrations at the expense of our kids. We can't just whoop our kids because we're aggravated and mad at them. We want to. I mean, that's the time. Like, I, it's hard for me to spank my, my little girl. She's so cute and I love her so much. But there's some times where, man, I just want to. I'll get back to that in a little bit. <laughs> so, it, it is possible to discipline our children without teaching them or molding their character and not turning them around and giving them the wisdom that goes with it. Uh... It can't be, well, this is how my parents did it, so that's how I'm going to do it. Or good or bad. My parents did this, so I'm definitely not doing that. Like, that can't be how we discipline our kids or why we discipline our kids the way we do. Good or bad, that isn't what tells us how to raise our kids. It must be the Word of God that we turn to to see how to raise our kids. In Deuteronomy Chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be fr uh, as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. We should fill our homes with the Word of God. It shouldn't be awkward for us to say, you know, God's Word says this. It shouldn't be awkward for us to pray with our children. Uh, this made me think of Mike's grandma's saying about being squeezed, you know, and what comes out. Um, if we fill our homes with scripture, I mean, it works with the individual, but also if we fill our homes with scripture, when our homes and our households and our family is squeezed, scripture comes out. Uh, once again, you go back to Proverbs 23. We already we were already there earlier, but. Um, we read 13 and 14 earlier. Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you strike him with a rod, he will not die. If you strike him with the rod, you will save his soul from shell. 
We must discipline, but look at the next two verses. Right after that, it says, in 15 and 16, it says, My son, if your heart is wise, my heart too will be glad. My inmost being will exalt when your lips speak what is right. And so our goal must be to impart wisdom to our children and train them in, correction, in the correction. That's uh, going back to what Brandon was saying earlier. When you do the right thing, you know, it's hard, but you send them to somebody else and you find out, man, these, your kids, you hear back good reports. Your kid's good. Your kid's doing something right that other kids may not be. It's, uh, it makes a father's heart glad. Uh, as we do this. So, um, once again, our goal must be to impart wisdom to our children and train them in correction. And then finally, we must pray with our children. Not only should we pray for them, but we must pray with them. When it comes to correction or punishment, we don't discipline them and just send them off their, to their rooms in exile. We hold them. We love them. We pray with them. And this is one of those things that, like I said, a lot of this hit me right here because I, I don't do this well. I haven't in the past. I hope to do it better, you know, starting after learning all this this week. Uh, and lastly, we need to be firm but also fair in our discipline. Hebrews 12.11 says, For the moment all discipline, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteous, righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I know that I've been in the wrong in this when I knew my daughter needed a spanking, but I didn't want to spank her, so... You know, didn't spank her really hard. Just, you know, give her a couple light pats. And then what happens? She laughed at me. You know, was like, <laughs> what was that? That didn't hurt. And so, and th that was wrong of me. That was doing her a disservice in, you know, not spanking her the right way. The point of discipline is that our children should be broken by it. It can't antagonize our kids but it must agonize our kids, or it's not punishment. Like it says, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. The punishment should also fit the crime. We can't have a blanket punishment for every offense. Some offenses are bigger than others, and we can't have the exact same punishment for every offense. It can't be five swats for everything. Uh, some things could just need a serious talk. Others, you know, maybe one or two pops. Others, maybe ten swats and grounding them for a year. It just depends. Also, at, sometimes as our kids get older, the best thing to do is taking away privileges. I'm not going to say that the only thing that we can do yielding the rod is to spank them. Taking away privileges works, especially as they get older. And I don't know that personally as a parent, but I remember that as a kid growing up. Uh, I remember getting into trouble as a 16-year-old, and my parents took my keys away. And I just, can you just whoop me? Can, can, can we just get this over with so I can have my keys back? So I can have my car? No, I had to sit and not have my car for a month, and... I learned a lot more than I learned from a, a spanking at 16 years old. So, yeah. Um, uh, I, I try to have the facade of a good boy. Uh, I was sneakier than uh, most kids. But my mom, she was smart, so she caught me uh, many times. But I tell you what, after getting my car keys taken away from me, I, I didn't do that. Whatever it was, I don't even remember what it was. I just remember the punishment, and I didn't. You live out in the middle of the country as a 16-year-old, and you just that's your access to the world, and they take that away from you. We didn't have cable then. Antenna just had snow. You had to 
move the antenna and find something. Maybe you'll find something on Fox. But uh, stuck out in the country without, without a ride and, and then having to call my boss. I had a job. I had to call my boss and tell him I couldn't work for a, week, uh, for a month. And I was, I was lucky I was a good employee because he didn't fire me. But anything. Anyway. Uh, yeah, that, that probably sunk in a lot more than a spanking would have for me. Uh, and then the last thing about being fair is that we must be consistent. Uh, we can't be strict about something one week and then the next week let it slide uh, because we're in a better mood or whatever the reason may be. If it's, if it's a punishable offense in our household, it needs to be a punishable, punishable offense at all times, no matter the mood or uh, attitude in the house uh, for the parents, no matter what's going on at work, what frustrations are. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a punishable offense week one, it's a punishable offense week four. Um, mm -hmm. I need to cool off. Once again, I didn't give Brandon my. I didn't give Brandon my notes. I promise. Uh, so yeah, um, exactly. And uh, let's see. Yeah, so we can't punish something more harshly because we're aggravated or in a bad mood. But so so our discipline needs to be consistent no matter what mood uh, us parents find ourselves in. Um, and then, you know, the, the other thing is, you know, anybody ever do, do the count to three thing? Like, by the time I count to three, or well, I, I started that, and I, somebody wiser than me told me I better stop before she gets older, uh, because then you're going to end up being like, you know, one, two, two and a quarter, two and a half, two and three quarters. Either they're being disobedient and need correction, or they aren't. And that must be a firm line that our children know and know what the consequences are for crossing that line. So, anything before I give us our quick conclusion? Yes, ma'am. Mm. I'm, I'm learning that very well. Or I'm not learning it very well. I'm, it's hard knocks learning it. <laughs> it's a uh, man. It's it's not easy uh, being consistent. And like I said, everything I've said this morning, I do not do well, and I need to do better. And I'm glad that Pastor Laramie gave me this subject to teach on because it's uh, and Scarlett's not going to be happy that he gave me this to teach on. Not not now anyway. Hopefully looking back she will be uh, if I'm able to uh, correct myself. But uh, in closing I came across seven rules that kind of sum up what we've been talking about this morning. These are not like black, white, hard facts, but they're general rules that I think uh, go well with us when we're disciplining our children uh, to keep in mind as we discipline our children. Number one, Communicate with your children and always be clear. They should know exactly why they're getting in trouble and what the rules are. Two, this is one uh, uh, Brandon uh, was talking about just a minute ago, maintain self-control. This is another paradox, and I kind of was, you know, hinting at it earlier. Uh, when you're mad and you just want to spank your kids so bad, that's the time you probably shouldn't. 
that's the time you should probably take a walk, you know, uh, take a few deep breaths, uh, and then and calm down. Then, when you're calm and self-controlled, at least in my experience, that's the time you don't really want to spank your kids. You don't like seeing your kids cry, and when you're, and that's when you need to spank them. So, like I said, that's the other paradox I was talking about earlier. And then three, which is as Janelle was saying, uh, some of these things are more difficult when we're in public or in situations. So this one is one to keep in mind when you're in public that we keep these things private. Don't spank your kids in front of a whole bunch of people. Uh, take them to the bathroom, send them to their room and meet them in there, take them to the car, whatever you got to do, but keep it private. I think this one fits under uh, Ephesians as well to not provoke your kids by embarrassing them. Um, and we haven't talked about this yet today, but number four suggests that we get a confession for what they have done. So have them confess to you what they've done to deserve the spanking that they're going to get or whatever punishment it is that they're going to get. Um, confession, repentance, and then re reconciliation. Number three, use a rod, as scripture tells us. Whether it be a paddle or a belt, or like I said, my mom used to use a wooden spoon on me. Um, uh, we should use something rather than our hand when possible. Once again, when, if you're out of the house, it may not, you may not have something with you. Uh, so that may not be a perfect example, but when possible, I would say it's good to use something other than your hand to discipline your kid. And then six, don't allow for anger or screaming from your child. Anger and malice are not the result uh, are, are not the result of repentance in our children. That's not our desired result. Not, we're not trying to upset them, have them scream and yelling at us. If we do the discipline correctly, they'll have a broken and contrite heart. And then number seven, and lastly. Seal the reconciliation that you have with your children with affection and prayer. Hold them. Tell them you love them. Pray with them. Let them know that this isn't something that has split you apart. They're still yours. They, uh, they've gotten their punishment. They've served their punishment. They're sorry. They reconcile. Love them and pray with them. And that's what I got for us this morning. Anybody got any, any thoughts on Anything else? No? All right, it's 1045, so I'll pray and let us get to the next part of our service. Father God, uh, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for teaching us every part of our lives, the way we should do things, and it's written in your word. It's written... God breathed for us to hear. Thank you for uh, bringing us together this morning. I ask that all we do the rest of this morning is uh, pleasing and glorifying to you. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.